Today we're going to just look a little bit more at the equilibrium modeling of adsorbents. So how can we tell how much material we're going onto some of those, those solids? All right. So last time we looked here at a few types. Here is an example of activated alumina, uh, which I showed you some pictures of the activated carbon, which we passed on the class, and then zeolite, which are very interesting uh, type of adsorbent, very specific and very selective based on size of the spheric effects a little bit at some of these numbers and then I left the class uh, at the end yesterday by saying I talk about this example over here. So this is a nice example just to illustrate how adsorption is used but it also will help tie in a few other concepts from your undergrad courses. So gold is Covered, but we're trying to separate gold from, from rock over here. So if you want a visual picture of this, it's helpful to, to have this picture in mind. If we take a piece of rock and we crush it down, now this is micrometer size. Okay, so this is in the order of 5 to 10 microns. You crush that rock down, gold will be exposed on the surface there. So there will be little pieces of gold and on the mineral surface. Now we'd like to get that gold out of, out of the solid and separate it from this remaining sand. Okay. So one way we can do that is if we can dissolve gold off the surface. So we can easily do that uh, using sodium cyanide. Um, now this process is not used very much anymore because of the toxic effects of cyanide and the large quantities of cyanide needed to achieve this. But under the right pH conditions, we can work with cyanide quite easily and comfortably and have for many years, not killing too many people. <laughs> so add, add some oxygen and slurry this up in water. So you've got your water, oxygen bubbling, and then cyanide added in there. Keep it at a very high pH, and you won't get any cyanide going into the vapor phase, and that's where your problems occur. So as long as you keep the pH high, you can work quite well with this. And you can move gold from the solid phase into the liquid phase. So when you get married and you get your gold ring, you don't put it in cyanide, it will disappear on you. Um, so there's one way of doing it, then that you get your gold in solution, that's called the orocyanide complex. Now, we have this gold now in solution. One way we can remove it is by adsorption. So activated carbon will adsorb that orocyanide complex and it has the additional advantage of doing that, it will drive that equilibrium forward. Because if you're removing AUCN2 out of solution onto that activated carbon surface, you're removing the product and you're going to drive that reaction forward, encouraging more gold to go out of solution. So that's really interesting use of adsorbent here. It is not only to separate out the, the liquid phase molecule, but also to drive the reaction kinetics in your favor. And what we can end up doing is we can load up that solid, that activated carbon, to the order of about 8 kilograms of gold per ton of activated carbon. So take an activated carbon, one ton of that, you can load up 8 kilograms of gold onto that. Now you've created your separation problem. Instead of separating solid phase gold from sand, now you have a different separation problem on your hand. Now you have to get that gold off the activated carbon. So you convert your separation problem from one form to another. Well, we can desorb that gold off the carbon by immersing it in caustic solution. Okay, so there's, uh, there's another separation step over there. And then when we get that gold off, we can precipitate it out and then smelt it down and refine it. What's caustic? Uh, sodium hydroxide. So we can uh, get gold off, precipitate it out, and then that carbon, which we've now desorbed the gold, we can recycle it. So um, if you ever travel to South Africa, you'll see a lot of this. Australia as well has, has this sort of um, typical plant that you see. So the nice thing about warm countries like Australia and South Africa is that all their chemical processes have, are outdoors. There's no enclosures, right? So from the highway, I took this photo uh, last year when I was visiting. And there you see a gold refinery, and it's simply a counter current flow exactly as, as, uh, as described here. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Here you've got your pulp, so that's your solid phase gold. 
and you're injecting your cyanide and oxygen and water here in a big CSTR. So these, each one of these is simply just a big CSTR. Oh, yeah, that's another one. It's like, I remember you showing this in 3K. Yeah. And it's all CSTR. So yeah. So just simply CSTRs in series, right? So let's take a look at a bit more what's going on there now. We've got this activated carbon. So here's new activated carbon flowing this way. And you've got counter current flowing this way to gold. Okay, so again, that same principle we learned from liquid. Liquid extraction applies here. This time we call it leaching. So leaching, it's another topic I wish I could cover in this course, but I don't because it's so similar to liquid liquid extraction that if you go into leaching in the future, you'll easily understand what's going on. So activated carbon flows, flows this way from right to left. The pulp flows from left to right. So it simply just cascades, and here they're just using gravity to do that for it. Okay. Now, activated carbon is nice because we've intentionally made that activated carbon and used activated carbon that's much, much larger in size than the pulp. So this pulp is crushed down to micrometer size, activated carbon is millimeter size. So we can separate that solid over here very simply with just a screen. We can separate out the activated carbon and send that off to elution. So, it's, so when you use this, uh, activated carbon, you don't want to create a new separation problem of now having two solids that you need to separate from each other. But we can, by using activated carbon much larger than the ore, the ore is very finely crushed, activated carbon is an order of magnitude larger in size, we can easily separate that into three. We could use sedimentation, we could use a cyclone, and all of those are typically done in practice. Um, here, a screen though is much, much easier. You simply just flow the material over, very little energy requirements. Then those tailings then go and they simply take that sand, now we've removed your gold. So the tailing, the, the pulp that you have coming in here, you've got gold in the order of 8 grams per ton, 6 grams per ton of gold. So you have to mine a whole ton of soil or rock to get 8 to 6 grams of gold. By the time it leaves there, it's less than 0 0.1, 0 0.5 grams of gold. And then that simply just gets pumped back into the ground or deposited. Um, in big tailings dams. Okay, so, so that's the principle there in that example. Here's another interesting case of an adsorber that's been used to pre-treat the gas stream to remove H2S and CO2. So three large adsorbers there you see, molecular C adsorber A, B, and C in series, sorry, in parallel. And the key thing I want to point out about this diagram is, well, firstly, the size of these units. So there's a little guy standing off here to the side somewhere. This refreshes. Okay, so, so that gives you an idea of the size of these units. The other thing that's important to point out is that these units will almost always be oriented vertically. Okay, we will, in our diagrams coming up next class, show horizontal units, but almost always they're used vertically because we get better mass transfer and more even distribution if you feed from the bottom up. If you feed sideways, you get some inhomogeneity in the, in the wave front. So bottom to top feeding is, is the preferred orientation for these units. And so here we're splitting our feed into A, B, and C, and you may be using A and B and regenerating C, and then you cycle around. So we'll talk about regeneration. Now adsorption, we, when, when should you use adsorption relative to membrane separations, for example, or distillation? Well, one way to look at it is to consider adsorption will work really well when you've got two isomers. We saw that example yesterday. Two isomers would have very close relative volatility, so distillation may not be appropriate or won't, won't succeed in separating those isomers. If you need large reflux ratios, so why do we use large reflux on a distillation column? Further separating? Sorry? To further like, separating? To further improve the separation. So okay. if you're separating two components and you use a higher reflux ratio, you're returning more material back to the distillation column. It has another go at being separated. So you can improve your purities with higher reflux ratios. But reflux also is energy intensive. 
that you're boiling that material up, sending it back in this vapor, and you're repeating that. So high reflux ratios um, are going to, to cause a greater energy consumption. So in your reboiler at the bottom and at the top on your condenser, both when you in increase your reflux ratio, you're increasing your energy consumption for heating and cooling on that column. Uh, and it may be such that the separating materials where high temperature or pressure drops are not going to work very well. They can deteriorate the product. So there's many instances where we'll have distillation or even membranes where we'll require too large an area for the membrane uh, that they won't be suitable and that adsorbent might be far more selective. You can pick an adsorbent that's very selective uh, to pick up a molecule of interest. Now the only problem is that you have to regenerate that mass separating agent that adds all that you're adding. You have some, you have to have a mechanism to regenerate it, and also recognize that your mass separating agent will break down over time. So if you're reprocessing that, that adds all that either through cyclone or pumps or filters, you're moving it around. You're going to physically break down that adds all that over time. Also, the regeneration step, even if you don't physically move your adsorbent, if you keep it in place and you push steam through, I'll talk about why we use steam as a mechanism to regenerate. You regenerate, reuse, regenerate, reuse. There's a finite number of cycles for which that, um, that adsorbent will be successfully regenerated. So it will break down over time, mechanically or structurally, and you'll have to replace it. Let's uh, start to look a little bit at some of the thermodynamics and at the equilibrium relationships for adsorption. Adsorption will release heat. So when you have adsorption occurring, small to medium amounts of heat are released. And we can see that simply by looking at this thermodynamic relationship that if I rearrange that equation for delta H, my enthalpy, uh, Gibbs is going to be negative if this works, if this moves in the, in the direction we want it to. Gibbs is going to be negative. Delta S is also negative. We're reducing the entropy of the system overall because we're taking molecules that are free to move and we're adsorbing them onto the surface. So delta S goes down, delta G is negative, so delta H must also be negative. So we're releasing some amount of heat. And the heat released are fairly low. If it's just a physical attraction between the adsorbents and the adsorbate. Um, and that also means if that, is, if that heat released is low, it means it's fairly easy to undo the, the attraction, right? So if the physical, physical Van der Waals attractions is really small amount of heats, we can undo it by adding a small amount of heat. Chemi-adsorption is considered adsorption where larger amounts of heat are released, so 100 kilojoules per mole, still not as much as you see from reaction. So a strongly exothermic reaction will release much higher amounts of heat, but this is still enough heat that you have to actually take care of it now in the energy balance and be considerate of it when you're designing your equipment. Okay, but it all, and it also means that you need to put in a bit more energy to reverse that adsorption. So when we want to regenerate our, catalyst, our, our adsorbent later on, we need to put in a bit more energy. Okay, now let's, I'm going to move on to talk about what we sh how we can visualize adsorption occurring on that surface. We're going to consider a surface and a molecule will come and attach to it and another one next to it and further down and we'll simply consider single layers forming on that surface until that entire surface is covered and then we may consider the second layer forming so we could have potentially another layer of forming with, with moderate attraction to that surface. And then your, this material could actually condense into a liquid phase onto that surface. But typically our models will concern ourselves just with single layer formation. We'll try and derive the kinetics of this and the equilibrium constants for this. So that's where, where we're going. Um, this slide is a little bit out of place. I just left it in there because you've probably printed the slides out already. So it should have been with some of the earlier material. So let me just quickly interject and talk about it while it's up here. <coughs> this is a, an example of a continuous phase adsorption. So typically adsorption will 
you take a batch of solid adsorbent, load up your, your adsorbate onto it, regenerate in a batch type cycle. But we know that batches are disruptive to our processes and from 4N we've worked that trying to interface continuous and batch processes means you need to spend a bit of extra money if we, if we can try to avoid. So here's one way that we can try to make the process a little bit more continuous and the cycle to follow is this anti-clockwise cycle of the adsorbent. So adsorbent, fresh adsorbent comes in from being regenerated, we'll cool it down first. We'll talk about why cooling is so important in a minute. So you've got cool or cold adsorbent available and your feed coming in over here. So your feed is a vapor phase stream coming in, cold adsorbent contacting it coming down, that material will adsorb onto the solid phase. And we'll force that vapor up out over there. So that vapor stream now should be free of the material that's being absorbed. The solids keep moving down, the solid phase adsorbent moves down, we will then recontact it with steam. So we heat up that solid and we're going to try and desorb the material we've just absorbed onto it. So heating up the adsorbent will reverse the adsorption and then that's where we remove that material. That adsorbate's just been removed over there down the side. We've got hot material leaving at the bottom. This adsorbent now is effectively regenerated. We can remove the, the material often and we can recycle it. Okay. Is that clear, that flow? Okay, so instead of trying to adsorb in a batch, shut down the process, regenerate, and, and repeat it again, here we have a continuous motion. This adsorbent gets used, it gets loaded up, then it gets stripped using steam and heat to undo the adsorption, then that hot adsorbent gets cycled down, we separate it perhaps with a cyclone or some form of just to make sure we're getting most of the adsorbent back and sending it back up to the top of our fluidized bed. So it's a continual cycle of the adsorbent flowing anti-clockwise through that circuit. And then here's an example of that uh, in Burkina Faso is a, is a, again, you can zoom in on some of these details over here and see there's not, I mean, again, just the scale of that, but there's, take a look over there, there's that bottom point where we take out that, that, that adsorbent. There's bags of spare adsorbent waiting there to be added to the system. The screen to, to, uh, to screen out any adsorbents and, and foreign particles that gets taken up to the top of the column. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the extent of the photo is cut off. So we can't see the top of the column. But then here on the sides of the column are our feeds and that, that stripping section. Okay. Um, here's, here's another example of doing it in a batch-wise manner. So what we're doing here is during the online case or when the bed is in the adsorption mode, we're feeding our wet gas. Here the aim of the adsorber is to remove moisture from that gas stream. That moisture remains on the packed bed and then we, we uh, dry the gas. So you may be move, removing water or some molecule of interest and then they'll simply call it wet gas. It's for a loaded gas and then this dry gas which is now being stripped of that, that, that adsorbate. Now to regenerate, we'll, you'll always regenerate in the opposite direction. This is a key point. Okay, so consider while you're using up the bed, the bottom of the bed is mostly going to be used up, and the top of the bed should, by and large, be relatively free of adsorbate. So as you, as you move this wet gas through, over a period of time, you'll have an interface which is delineating the part of the adsorbent that's being used versus the part that's not being used. So this top part of the bed is not being used until you detect that there's some adsorbent adsorbate coming off here. So in other words, your bed is all used up. Uh, most of the top of this bed is relatively unused. So when we regenerate, it seems a little counterintuitive to regenerate in the opposite direction. You're going to put this heat on the part of the bed that's mostly unused. 
But it's important to do that, and in fact, you have shorter regeneration times by doing so. You really do want to ensure that that top of the bed is fully regenerated because that's the last point of contact when you go and reuse the bed again in the next cycle. That top of the bed really must be fully desorbed so that you get good performance of this system. Okay, so that's the reason for countercurrent, uh, sorry, for regenerating in the opposite direction. Now, we'll, when we regenerate, we'll raise the temperature. That will be one way. And what that does is shift the equilibrium constant. We'll see why that's important. We'll also, what we can do is we can lower the pressure in the system. So draw a vacuum. And that will desorb the material off the solid phase. So that's called pressure swing adsorption. Because in, you, you pressurize the system and then you depressurize it to, to strip off the solid. Another way you can desorb is by displacing what you have adsorbed. So you've adsorbed a molecule of interest. If you now come in with steam, which is hot, so that if you raise the temperature and steam will displace the other molecules of interest, then you can uh, regenerate that way. So let's take a look at what's going on inside an adsorber from the, at, at a micro scale. So at the micro scale, you've got material diffusing in the bulk phase, that's usually very fast. So your adsorbate is diffusing through the bulk fluid. So if you consider H2S might be the material you want to remove, and it's in a, in a hydrocarbon stream. Hydrocarbons are the bulk phase, H2S is your adsorbate, and H2S diffusion through that hydrocarbon is very fast. But what you want is you want that H2S then to deposit here on the surface. So you also need the diffusion of the adsorbate through sort of this boundary layer. So there'll be like a boundary layer of hydrocarbon over here, and you want this H2S molecule to diffuse close to that surface. And if there's multiple pores you, on this adsorbent, you want it to diffuse through those pores. So there's several diffusion mechanisms we could consider. Then when we consider, when we look at equilibrium, we're going to see that it's going to be attracted to sites that are vacant. So the more vacant sites you have available, the greater the rate of adsorption. Once your, once your surface starts filling up, there's going to be fewer and fewer sites available. The reaction or the kinetics of it attaching to that surface are going to slow down. Okay, so we're going to look at it from that equilibrium perspective. Now, for those of you that are taking 4K with Prashant, this, this sort of derivation will make a lot of sense because it's exactly the same mechanism that catalysts are used. Okay, so that catalytic diffusion and equilibrium forming on a catalytic surface is identical. In fact, many zeolites are used as catalysts and that reaction, that catalytic reaction takes place on the zeolite surface. So, what we're going to end up with here is what is an isotherm. Okay, so, and the reason why we're going to look at the isotherm derivation is we want to know how much adsorbent we need. That's one of our ultimate questions. How much adsorbent do I need to buy to uh, make the system work? And equilibrium isotherms are going to tell us that. So rather than, I'll come back to this definition, but essentially an isotherm will tell us the relationship of what's in the vapor phase versus what's deposited on the surface. So let's look at this derivation then. We can consider the most simplest case is a linear isotherm, or basically it's, it's an application of Henry's law that says the concentration on the surface is a linear relationship to the concentration in the bulk phase. So what that says is, by definition, that equation will go through zero with some slope k, and let's take an arbitrary point over here on that line. It says CA over here. It's important to understand the units. It's kilograms of adsorbate per meter cubed of fluid. So it's, this is the concentration in the bulk phase. So if we look at my solid, Is my solid with all where, where I'm attaching to in the bulk phase, 
this, this CA concentration, this concentration of adsorbate per meter cubed of fluid. And that's going to be in equilibrium with, that's the, this is the key point, this isotherm assumes that equilibrium has occurred, some sort of concentration of the solid, so, I'm sorry, some sort of concentration of the adsorbate on the solid. So CAS, then over here, CAS is equal to the concentration of adsorbate on the solid, or more correctly, adsorbate. Okay, so we, and we measure that as kilograms per kilogram. So this axis here has units of mass of the mass, and this unit has units of mass per meter cubed. And K then is that slope to link that up. Now it's, this is a very poor assumption, it, and it works for dilute fluids very well, but for concentrated materials, uh, it's not a good, a good isotherm. But it works, it works adequately in certain conditions, so we should be aware of it. Further, I mean, and the reason why it's not good, consider the following. What if you increase the amount of material in the vapor phase? So CA, you increase the amount of adsorbents, sorry, amount of adsorbates per meter cube per fluid. <coughs> If you just raise that concentration higher and higher and higher, this relationship tells you you're able to load up the solid more and more and more. So as CA goes up, this says you simply keep adding more and more material on to your solid surface. Now we know that there must be a finite capacity to adsorb. Right? We, we cannot pretend that if I raise CA, higher and higher that my CAS, my mass of solid, I'm sorry, my mass of adsorbate per mass of solid also just keeps increasing. That solid adsorbent has a finite capacity. So this is only true under dilute conditions will this relationship hold. So normally, um, after a point CAS would just be constant. It's your increase the amount. Okay, so what might we expect the shape to look like? So right now we've got a ramping up as a line, plateau. Okay, concave, convex. Right. Okay, so you may expect it to then do that sort of thing, right? Which is why Henry's law, this linear relationship works well over here. At dilute concentrations of CA, so low low concentrations in your fluid phase, that equation works really well. Okay, but beyond a certain point, you absolutely expect it to plateau up. So let's take a look then at this next example. This example says, well, we recognize that that's not a reasonable relationship. So there's this purely empirical model. There's no theoretical basis for it. But we say there's this constant k, and we raise it to a power that's smaller than 1, so 1 over m overall is smaller than 1, and that gives you that, that tapering off. And we can easily calculate the constant m and the constant k from a long, long plot. Okay, but what, how would you find the points to plot on a long, long plot? What would you actually do in an experiment to get this data? Okay, so can you be a little bit more specific? We want points on that curve. What exactly will you do in the lab to get the points on that curve? Would you, how do you set up your experimental system? What do you measure? And, uh, I don't know what you call the difference in that. So, it's so, uh, run flow rates in the model so where it's all flat out. Okay, so the suggestion is to pack various columns with different amounts of solid adsorbents yeah. and run the same flow rates. Or run different flow rates in each and see how they're all responding. Okay, so what do you measure? Or yeah, when, when do you measure? And you how have to measure how much um, solids 
you're, or how much absorbate you're getting out of it, because um, then you can see how all, like, how much surface area it is taking up. Okay, so you need to measure CA, or CAS. CAS. So which one can you measure? Can you measure CAS? Not directly. Not directly. But what if you measure it by inference? Can you measure it in some other way? Okay, so you do both and measure the concentration solutions, right? You can also just do the mass of the absorbent with the absorbing on it. Okay. It would be like a, the difference if you was absorbed onto it. Okay, calculate by difference. I was just going to say that you can measure CA before and after, and then the difference would be. Okay, so measure CA before and after, and then you know how much be, has been absorbed from the mass balance. So that's exactly right. You would set up in a lab different beakers, put in maybe the same amount of solid material, five grams in each beaker, load it up with different concentrations of CA, let it come to equilibrium and you measure how much has been adsorbed, then you know what CAS is, how much is remaining is CA, and you can plot points on the log log plot. Okay, so, so you have to be aware of this because this is exactly how we do it. Right? In practice, we don't know what those constants K, R, and M are for our system. Right? Every system you deal with, these are not constants you can look up in, in carries, for example, or in textbooks. They're very specific for the adsorbent that you've picked and for the fluid that you're dealing with. So, so that's exactly how we do it. Then there's this other derivation for the Langmuir isotherm, which gets us comes from a far more theoretical perspective. What I'll do is I'll go through that next class. Um, and essentially what the Langmuir isotherm does is it tapers down a little bit more than the Flanderic isotherm and, and models reality a little bit more carefully. I mean, how many of you have taken a bio, the michaelis menten reaction? So this, this is exactly that same structure over there, is what this comes down to. And if you've taken 4K, you would have derived a similar diagram. So we'll look at that next time. But what I'd rather do is let's just work through a problem quick to try and um, try and understand what's going on here. So here's, here's this problem. I've printed it out for you. So I'll, I'll hand it around. Uh, you can start reading it up there. Take a few minutes to think of your strategy to solve this problem.
So what don't we know about the system? What do we know? What equations might apply here? So let's take a look at uh, the system and there's, if you read the, the, the write-up over there, you realize that there's two phases to this process. There's a lab scale test done, the bench scale experiment, and then there's the full scale experiment. What is it that we're trying to determine? What's our aim? So the question says for the full scale, so we know it's, it's for that. But what specifically are we calculating? Yeah, that's the last one. What else? So symbolically. So the relationship between C and C S. So we're told that that's linear. Like what, that, like what, what that slope actually is. So that there's a, 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 a goal there is to calculate k. Anything else on the full scale system we're interested in? Right, it's, it's over there in part one. We want to calculate the concentration of solution in the adsorber and concentration on the adsorbent. Okay, so that in saying, in other words, we want to calculate the full scale CA and CAS values. 
and to get there, as Janet mentioned, we need to know that slope k. That's something we're going to need along the way. So if we're trying to explore the system, I mean, most people often have a hang up on that in the problem solving strategy. What do we mean by explore? Well, explore here simply says, recognize we're dealing with adsorbents and adsorption occurring. So when we say explore, we say, what sort of equations might apply? Okay, so it's that isotherm equation uh, would be required. So CAS equals KCA may apply. Is what that intention is. So okay, we'll explore. <coughs> yes. Um, which is the um, which is CAS? Is, is, is CAS the concentration of A and the other adsorbent? No, CAS is the concentration of A and adsorbent. CA is the concentration of A and adsorbent. It's on the previous slide. Uh, so when we're looking at that, we've got CA, CAS, and K here now as our variables. What do we know? What do we don't? What don't we know? <coughs> we don't know K. We don't know K. Do we have CA and CAS? We get CAS. We can get CAS. And we can get CA. So let's plan that. Plan how we might do that. Let's be fairly specific here. So how would you get? We're 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 obviously going to from the way the question is worded, we're going to take the lab scale data and apply it to the full scale system. So for the lab scale, what, how are we going to calculate that K value? Um, you can also, you also know that the um, line that you draw goes through the origin. Okay, so yeah. the line passes through the origin for sure. Okay, so that comes from that, from understanding what that equation is over there, right? Okay, so in the lab scale system, how how would you go about getting that K value? Um, from the information you have, you have CAS and CA, and how you find CAS is you just um, take point nine, you find like how many grams have been absorbed on the surface, okay. and then divide that by three grams to get the CAS yeah. concentration. Okay, and CA then is found. Um, that's given. By 90, the 96 percent being removed. No, that's huh? the initial one. Is it no. the initial one? So it's the four percent. Okay, and this is why this question is is important to understand. Is CA equal to the 0 0.05 grams per liter times one liter? What does the isotherm tell us? It's the equilibrium concentration. So, okay. so the, the picture to have in mind is at the end of the batch, you've got the system, we've got adsorbent, and there's some sort of concentration CA here, and on that surface is a concentration CAS in equilibrium. Okay, but CA is not the concentration added. You add additional material, some of it's going to remain in solution, some of it's going to get adsorbed onto the surface. It's, you know that since 96 of it is removed, and what's left is 4% of that additional? It's the 4%, and that's going to get you CA. Okay? So very important is CA is not what you add to the system initially. It's what's remaining behind in the fluid phase, and it's in equilibrium with CAS. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at that. We, we said earlier when we were doing these experiments, that one reason why I asked is how you would run this experiment, is so that you can think of this setup here in the lab, and we, we mentioned we'll do a mass balance. Well, let's take a look at what a mass balance would look like in the system. So mass balance, as we know, say accumulation is in minus out. That's typically what you're used to. So let's. Uh, reword that a little bit in the context of this problem. So accumulation would be what's remaining. Okay. Is equal to N is what you what's in the what you're adding to the system over there. So added initially. Minus out. Out is being adsorbed. onto the solid.
Okay, another way you can say, see it is if you add a certain amount of material, it's either going to remain in solution or it's going to get adsorbed into the solid. So you rearrange this equation. So what you add, what you start off with initial, so initial amount, it's going to get split into two parts. It's going to either be adsorbed and remain in solution. Okay, so that's it's just a simple rearrangement of that mass balance principle. So what's the initial amount that we added? It was given up there, 0 0.05 grams per liter multiplied by one liter. Okay, so that 0 0.05 grams needs to get split into two portions. Some of it gets adsorbed, the rest of it remains in solution. So how does it get broken up? Where do we start? Which one? Which one do we know most about? What's adsorbed? We know what's remaining. Okay, so remaining is how much? 4% of what was added. Okay, so Remaining is 0 0.04 times 0 0.05 grams per liter times one liter. But you also know that 96% is Yeah, by difference. Yeah. Okay, so, so this we can calculate as 0 0.002 grams. That's equal to 0 0.05 grams. And then by difference, either the 96, it just depends on your frame of reference, then we'll give you the difference over there. So that's 0 0.048. Okay, so to measure than this one. Okay, and so this is going to be important next class. Measuring what's adsorbed is always done by difference. It's all, you can practically measure what's measured, what's adsorbed, but it's much, much harder to measure than what's simply remaining in solution. Okay, so so that's the breakdown over there. So now what do we we're still after getting to this K value. So what's C A and C A S in the lab scale? So in the lab, then we've got CA is equal to 0 0.002 grams. But CA is measured as grams per meter cubed of fluid per one liter. Okay, and then CAS is 0 .00, uh, 0 0.048 grams per three grams of salt. Okay, and then we can show that K is equal to 8. 8 of what units? Okay, so liters per gram. this question, I'll leave you to do at home and we'll take it up next time. But um, if you calculate the answer for that, how much adsorbent do you need, you should get an answer of 4.95 kilograms. Okay, so give that one a try and we'll show that in the next class.